Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Devante Dawson. Um, he's presenting his dissertation work today. Um, he graduated in August, and um, before he came to UF, he did his bachelor's at Tuskegee in both marine biology and uh, pre-health biology. He also did a master's at Tuskegee in biology, and then he came here to work at UF um, on a McKnight Fellowship, where he looked at um, Nidarian microbiome interactions, and he's going to tell us some about some of his work um, now. Um, he's coming to us from the Marshall Islands, where he's working on a postdoc. Um, he's, he's doing a postdoc in Stanford University, but he's out in the field right now in the Marshall Islands. So, well, fingers crossed for good connection. Um, and we also thank him for getting up so early in the morning because it's like six in the morning or something for him. So um, with that, I will I'll let Do uh, Dr. Dawson take it away. Thanks, Julie. It's uh, still crazy to hear a doctor. Haven't gotten used to it yet, but it's a great, <laughs> great addition to have. Um, I also want to thank everybody else here who's uh, attending and good morning. Yes, it is six o'clock over here. Um, I know it's close to two over there, but I just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, and without further ado, I will get started on my public doctoral defense where I will be discussing investigating potential bioindicators of health and environmental stress in the Nigerian hollow biome experiencing multiple stressors. As an overview, we'll be going over chapter one as an introduction. Chapter two will be terming the absolute quantification of a friend or foe. Chapter three will be exploring the holobion plasticity in the model organism Exceptasia diaphana under short-term thermal stress and nutrient enrichment. And for chapter four, we'll have a synthesis and conclusion. And to sum everything up, I will also talk about my uh, current research. Although coral reefs contribute a small percentage, uh, less than 1% to the geographical composition of tropical and subtropical waters, they support approximately 25% of all identified marine species. And they can generate between $375 billion to $9.9 .9 trillion on resources and ecological services like coastal protection, a source of food via fisheries, raw materials, and tourism-based industries. Essential productivity and sustainability of these reef ecosystems rely on healthy coral. Yet the compounding effects of environmental stressors like nutrient enrichment, thermal stress, overfishing, ocean acidification, and disease threaten 75% of all reefs to where we have reefs that have a lot of biodiversity and a lot of activity in this picture, transitioning into a reef ecosystem that looks like this, that is dominated by macroalgae, and there's a lot less biodiversity there and a lot, a lot less activity. So if corals, coral reefs rely on healthy corals, what do healthy coral rely on? The foundation of healthy coral rely on a dynamic relationship with a distinct and diverse group of microbes that are responsible for environmental adaption and immunity. Uh, the well-known symbiosis that has been studied for a long time now is the symbiosis between a coral host and their symbiodemesiae, which are intracellular diaphragmatic algae that provide them with their daily energy needs. The other aspect, the microbiome, has been far less studied, but we are gaining a lot of information and knowledge about just how important this aspect of this symbiosis as, is important as well, uh, because these beneficial microbes help with nutrient cycling and pathogen resistance. And these two components 
in addition to the coral hollow barnet, or what we know as, well, the coral host is known as the coral hollow barnet. You, you cut me out, Ben. I don't know. Chapter two, determining the absolute quantification of a friend or foe. Acropolis over Cornus was a once dominant reef taxa in the Florida and Caribbean reef track. But within the last 50 years, there has been a significant uh, deterioration of their populations because of exposure to multiple stressors, including bleaching and white band disease. And because of these stressors, we've had these great reef ecosystems that Acropria serve as the building blocks for going from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. And this deterioration of the aesthetic quality, habitat complexity, and biological diversity um, has forced uh, the government to essentially list this species as threatened under the Endangered Species Act and also critically endangered under the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Now, if you may remember, I said that um, Acropolis of Cornus has experienced a lot of disease and more specifically white band disease. And you may ask, well, what causes infectious disease susceptibility? And that could be a very complicated question to answer. Um, there are a lot of varying interactions between the coral host and pathogens and other microbial members that are affected by environmental changes and affect infectious disease susceptibility. In certain cases of diseases, there are identifiable pathogens that cause those diseases. But in the case of white band disease, that cause is still unknown. And the researchers are starting to move away from looking at one agent being the cause of every, every single disease and are starting to focus more so on what we uh, have termed as dysbiosis, which is just an uncontrolled growth of certain microbes um, due to environmental stressors. And this overgrowth uh, arguably causes those microbes to switch from a commensal or beneficial member of the coral microbiome to having a more parasitic role where it reduces the host health and also increasing disease susceptibility. Since 1975, all historical and genetic studies of Apropos over Cornus outbreaks have of white band disease have detected an obligate intracellular rickettsia-like organism, or RLO, that was recently named Canadatus ocarichetsia rori, which I like to call ocarit because it's a lot easier to say and that it's a mouthful. So I will probably be changing between ocarit and ocarichetsia throughout this presentation. Um, Alcaric is hypothesized to be a highly nutrient responsive symbiont that parasitizes Acropius over Cornus by taking nutrients and energy through excessive growth, which then in turn induces increased white band disease susceptibility in Acropius over Cornus. The issue that we've run into though is that when we look at these studies or we look at the abundance of uh, aquarichetsia, we see large quantities in both healthy and disease samples, which raises a lot of questions regarding its actual um, influence on white band disease in Acropolis of Acornis. But it also gives us very telling information to help with our research because we, again, we see that there are high numbers in healthy and disease samples, meaning that there possibly is an abund abundance threshold that aquarichetsia must meet before it switches from a commensal, uh, commensal symbiont 
to a parasitic one. And with that, we have been trying to figure out exactly how to figure that out and what that abundance threshold is. But the issue with a lot of the research done with, uh, with Aqua Rick and abundances is that the most common method is using relative abundance that is generated from 16S rRNA gene profiling. However, these studies on relative abundance have a lot of systematic biases that significantly distort the perceived microbial composition. Um, and though there have been a lot of computational advances to try to address and correct these biases, uh, these techniques cannot adequately reflect how specific microbial species differ from samples or experiments. And just to give a little bit further insight on what I mean by these biases, uh, when we do high output throughput DNA sequencing as far as relative abundance, this data only shows a relative only shows relative information about a small part of the original environment, but it doesn't give us the exact numbers of the microbes within that sample. And to provide more perspective on that. What I mean is that when we do these type of tests and we analyze the microbiome composition, if one taxa increases, the relative abundance of all the other taxa in the sample will always decrease, um, even if there were no changes in the absolute numbers of those other taxa. And therefore, because we understand these biases, our aim was to figure out an accurate, accurate and reliable way to quantify aquaric to determine this uh, abundance threshold that caused it to switch from a commissal to a parasitic symbiont. Now you may ask, how do we ensure accurate, accurate and reliable quantification? As stated previously, the Quantitative PCR has become the standard technique for quantifying genes, but a lot of the statistics that come with that can produce false positives, be highly variable and non-reproducible in other experiments. We have a new novel technique known as droplet digital PCR, which the procedure for amplifying uh, the targeted genes are similar to qPCR. However, they, this, the foundation of this approach relies on two key distinctions that make it better than um, qPCR sequencing uh, slash relative abundance. Before the PCR is conducted, the actual sample is split into thousands of uh, separate reactions. And those reactions actually give us a positive or a negative and serve as counts of gene copies. And this provides us with an easier way, easier and more accurate way for identifying and amplification of microbes that we're trying to study. But we wanna know whether or not the standard methodology that is used in the field right now, how does that compare to the gene copies that you would get from DDPCR? And luckily, I had colleagues that were in the lab before me that collected coral samples from um, the Central Caribbean Marine Institute. And these samples were already collected and relative abundance was performed on them. So we already had some relative abundance side to, to compare, but I needed to get the information for the DDPCR. And so in order to conduct DDPCR, we have to target specific genes associated with aquarichisia. Uh, in order to get gene copies. And to do that, 
we use, well, I use the Primer 3 website to design specific primers uh, using open public genomes to target these genes within Acherichia. And we decided to target three genes. The Rickettsiales BIR homolog or RVH, 16S rRNA gene and internal transcribed spacers, also known as the ITS, and the TLC1 gene. And just to give a little bit more further insight, there is a whole process that we went through to make sure that all the genes that we were targeting were the only genes that were present. And so we started with the initial basic validation, which is endpoint PCR, and making sure that we are targeting those specific genes. We then sent those samples off for Sanger sequencing, and qPCR was also conducted on them to, again, make sure that we were targeting the right genes. And then we had uh, a Denovix high sensitivity DNA fluorescence assay, which essentially, essentially takes into account a dilution series so we can get a well-defined range of how many gene copies are in the samples. And then once we did that, we were able, luckily, our sequencing center is at the bottom in the same building as our lab. So we literally just walked down the samples to uh, to the people in the University of Florida's Interdisciplinary Center for Biotechnology Research. And they actually conducted the DDPCR to assess the gene copies per nanogram of DNA. And I know you're already asking, why did we choose these genes? Uh, don't worry, I will explain all of that. And so the first, we'll talk about why I chose the RVH gene. The first reason was because all Rickettsiales genomes sequence thus far encodes for this gene, uh, meaning that not only uh, Rickettsia, but all other species within that Rickettsiales uh, genus have it as well, because a lot of the other uh, species of Rickettsiales are also parasites to terrestrial hosts, and it was an easy gene to choose. RVH is also a type for secretion system, and this is believed to be directly involved in um, virulence, which because it has, it's involved in host cell attachment and DNA transfer uh, into the actual host, and also the high force secretion systems are thought to play a pivotal role in the transition of a microbe that was once able to survive without a host to becoming an, an obligate microbe that has that lives intracellular and must rely on its host for energy and nutrients. So for our results, uh, we first compared the uh, gene copies of the RVH gene per nanogram of DNA, which is our DDPCR on the y-axis, and the relative abundance of the amplicon sequence variants on the x-axis, which is our qPCR. And for this original comparison, we only used nine samples uh, from three three separate genotypes. And what we found was that the RVH gene copies were not correlated to the relative abundance from the Illumina qPCR. And if you remember, I said that when looking at relative abundance, there are potential biases that could be introduced from this uh, 16S amplicon information. And so we decided to also, we decided to also 
compare the ratio of the RV RVH gene to the 16 sRNA using universal primers for microbes on the uh, Y axis and then the relative abundance again on the X axis. And what we found was that again, this ratio of the RV, RVH gene to the 16S RNA was not correlated to the relative abundance um, found in Illumina qPCR. In addition to this, in, in addition to the lack of correlation, we also realized that there were low counts of the RVH gene copies uh, when we were doing the comparison. And this may be because the RVH gene may not be present or may not be signaled always in Ocarichisia. And because it may not be present or there might not be a single a signal always, the RVH gene may not be effective enough to target Ocarichisia for absolute abundance quantification. And therefore, we decided to move on and evaluate additional primer sets. The second primer sets that we chose to use were the 16S IT re ITS region and this target was chosen because it was more conserved just for aquarichisia and nothing else. And so first I would like to mention that unlike that first set of data points where we were looking at the RVH gene, for our 16S ITS gene, we were able to add 54 additional acropolis over cornice samples uh, because between the years of selection in 2017 and 2019, we the samples at the nursery experienced a white fan disease outbreak. And so luckily, well, unluckily and luckily for us, we were able to have samples that were healthy and diseased and also apparently healthy, which were samples that weren't collected in the disease area, but they were fairly close to that area. So it may have provided some type of outlook on the progression of that disease. And so for this linear regression on the y-axis, we have uh, the gene copies of the 16S ITS per nanograms of DNA. And on the x-axis, we have relative abundance again. And then the graph is divided into two sections. On the left being sample health, where apparently healthy is the yellow color, the healthy is blue, and the disease samples are orange. And then on the right, we have genotype. And there were five genotypes that included the three previous genotypes, the green, the red, and the yellow. And we also had two additional genotypes, black and blue. And what we found, again, similar to the RVH gene, was that the 16S ITS gene copies were not correlated to the relative abundance. And so that was strike two and, you know, three strikes and you're out. So we decided to try one more uh, gene, and that would be the TLC1 gene. And this was targeted because it is directly responsible for the exchange of host ATP or energy for ADP, which is then used by Ocarichisia as energy. And luckily, on this last attempt, there was a correlation, and it was a negative correlation. And again, for this graph, we have the gene copies from DDPCR of the TLC1 gene on the y-axis and the relative abundance on the x-axis. And when I say that there was a negative correlation, I mean that as the gene copies of the TLC1 increased, there was a decrease in the relative abundance of ocular And if 
the relative abundance was a good indicator of abundance of aquariticia. We would see a positive correlation where as one increases, the other increases, but we saw the opposite. And so from that, that was interesting. And we're like, okay, there's something there. Um, but we also wanted to look at and see, are the TLC1 gene copies significantly different based on health status and genotype? And so this is a uh, bar, bar plot with the gene copies again on of TLC1 on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis are the sample health, the sample health types. And what we found was that first, the TL1C, TLC1 gene copies were significantly significant in the sample health. And that only provides us one outlook but we can dive deeper in that and get more information. And so what we were able to find was that when compared between healthy and disease, there were a lot higher quantities of T TLC1 genes within disease samples than healthy samples. And so the takeaways from my first chapter looking at aquariticia was that the absolute quantification and the relative abundance of aquariticia are not correlated. Um, and I'm not saying that researchers should move away from using um, relative abundance because it can provide good information. This just shows that for microbiome studies, we shouldn't rely solely on relative abundance to provide us answers to our question. And then with the increased TLC1 genes um, that we saw in the disease samples, it can signify an increase in uh, aquariticia and thus in disease susceptibility for white band disease. And because we saw this increase in TLC1 genes in disease samples, and it was significant with absolute quantification of the TLC1 gene, it can help us determine this abundance threshold that aquariticia must reach to switch from, the, from a commensal microbe to a parasitic one. And if we can figure that out, Aquariticia can help us investigate the white band disease susceptibility for Acropolis with Recornis. And my, first, my second chapter was focusing on just one microbe. But for chapter three, as I stated previously with dysbiosis, it doesn't necessarily just have to be one microbe. It can be multiple microbes that are experiencing dysbiosis that can throw off the holobiont. So for chapter three, I wanted to explore holobiont micro microbial plasticity in the model organism Exaptasia diafauna under short-term thermal stress and nutrient enrichment. Both the symbiodenisiae and the microbiome can offer specific links as bioindicators to environmental conditions and the health status of the coral host, um, which can be used for short-term short and long-term monitoring and can be effective for environmental management programs. As stated previously, the coral rely on the symbiodenisiae for their daily energy needs. But in the case of bleaching, it triggers an impairment or disassociation of the symbiotic algae as a stress response from the coral. So the coral basically gets rid of its symbiodenisiae, and that's where we see the visible form of bleaching that most people know of. 
But while people see this visible bleaching response, there is an impairment of this, this relationship that can occur without any visible identification. And that can happen within minutes or days of experiencing some type of leaching response. And this also goes for the microbiome as well, because we know that rising temperatures disrupt the microbiome, um, inducing higher susceptibility and favoritism of opportunistic microorganisms and potential pathogens. So on both ends of the spectrum for the symbiodynesia and the microbiome, these changes can essentially be tracked and be used as bioindicators. And so for the purpose of my study, we know that rising temperatures disrupt the hollow bion and its uh, microbial symbionts. But there's also been changes in land, land use practices, which has increased the amount of nutrients uh, going into the ocean or affecting the near shore reefs. And the issue with this additional stressor is that a lot of research has have postulated or shown that these stressors together could act synergistically to invoke an even worse condition than just one stressor alone. And this has been seen with temperature and nutrients because nutrients also aids in the growing prevalence and severity of multiple diseases and bleaching events. And so with these two stressors combined, they both induce more microbial shifting from a healthy to a dysbiotic state, which is not good. And this dysbiotic state expresses stochastic behavior. And what I mean um, by stochastic behavior is that there's no rhythm and rhyme to how these microbial uh, tags are changing. It's really random. And we have, there's no indication of why they're making these changes. And with these changes, we've seen shifts and increases in alpha diversity and beta diversity. And alpha diversity is a statistical analysis looking at the microbiome of each individual sample. And then the beta diversity is looking at the microbiome of a community. Um, so we have alpha diversity on one hand looking at individuals, whereas beta diversity is also looking at those individuals, but the individuals of the same community are shared and looked at on that level. And with that, this dysbiosis caused by stressful environmental conditions uh, can often be detected before these physical signs of stress or death. And so the idea is that if we can track these photophysiology changes from the symbiodynesia and the changes in the bacterial community structure and how they dis display dysbiosis, it can be essential for short-term short and long-term uh, reef management. Now, of course, we would always want to use coral for these type of studies. Um, because that is what we're trying to save. But corals are difficult. They are very, very difficult, especially in laboratory conditions, as well as with all the regulatory laws that are placed on some of these corals, including our copper server corners. It's harder to get the permits needed to sample these colonies. And also, in the case of me, I started, well, I didn't start, but COVID hit in the middle of starting my PhD journey. And so that made it a hundred times harder to try to do anything. And so in a lot of situations where you have an organism that you want to study, but it may not be, um, it may not be readily available or easy to study that, that organism, 
we look for model organisms that might not necessarily, we can't make direct correlations between the two, but they are similar enough to provide us an, an idea of what may be happening. And this is the case for Aptasia, which have been used since the mid 70s as a model organism to study the symbiotic relationships um, between coral. And the reason why Aptasia are being used is because both coral and Aptasia are in the same family, the Niberian family. And there are a lot of other features of Aptasia that has its advantages for studying uh, the microbial symbiosis within the coral holobiome. Whereas corals have slow growth rates, Aptasia, uh, Aptasia can grow very rapidly and are very easy to cultivate um, in a lab laboratory setting. Corals have also have meticulous growth rates, growth, growth conditions, but Aptasia can survive in various conditions. And what I mean by various conditions is that they have the ability to survive under bleaching conditions and live in a, a aposymbiotic state, which means that you can take the symbionts, the algal symbionts away from the Aptasia and then for, and they can survive like that for months or years. And then they can be uh, reinfected with another uh, clade or another taxa of the Symbiotonesia. And while we have limited accessibility to coral to look at the microbiome and the microbial symbiosis associated with coral, Aptasia have been found to have um, their microbiome and symbiognitia are taxonomically comparable and display plasticity. And what I mean by plasticity is the range of different assemblages, assemblages of microbiome um, members and the symbiognitia. So for my methods, uh, we, I um, used 162 total Aptasia. And these Aptasia were housed in tanks that were all connected to a sump, a sump system that I helped build with while my lab member provided the outline and everything because I had no idea what a sump system was before it was introduced to me. And the purpose of this pump system is to uh, connect all the tanks to one water supply in order to limit the variability uh, between tanks. And so for the actual experiment, we wanted to simulate bleaching. And so we used temperatures that were synonymous with the 2014 bleaching event that happened in Florida, where 25 degrees Celsius was the uh, regular ambient temperature that corals can, that corals thrive in. Uh, 30 degrees Celsius was the first sign of bleaching that we're seeing. And then 32 degrees Celsius was the highest temperature recorded that year. Um, and so that was used to simulate thermal stress. In addition to this thermal stress, we also wanted to have some type of nutrient enrichment. And we had a solution of more, a one micromolar of ammonium chloride, 0.1 micromolar of potassium nitrate, and 0 0.05 micromolar of potassium phosphate. And you may be wondering where we got these numbers from. And there was a study conducted in Miami and these were the amounts that this study was shown for the introduction of nutrients from the Miami area into the water surrounding it. So this was a good example of residential nutrient introduction into the surrounding water. And so we want to use this as our um, 
as our nutrients. And so just to give a overview of the timeline for this experiment, it was over three weeks. And on the first five days of the experiment, I sampled every day. And then on the following two weeks, I sampled every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, the little shrimp, uh, our brine shrimp, and that's what I used to feed the anemones. And I fed them every Wednesday. And then I did water changes, which are the little droplets, every Friday and Monday to minimize the amount of contamination or introduction of other microbes that may come from feeding the adaptation. And so to quantify the symbiote denisia abundance, again, because I wanted to have absolute quantification, I used DDPCR and I targeted the acting gene, which is in all symbiote denisia clades. And then for the microbiome, I use CCS rRNA gene sequencing to determine what taxa were actually present in my samples of Aptasia. So our first question was, did thermal stress and nutrient enrichment affect survivability? And surprisingly, I found that Aptasia under both stressors actually survived longer. And what you're looking at here is a uh, survival plot. And on the y-axis is the survival of the Aptasia, and on the x-axis is time. And the top three graphs are showing you just temperature, the temperature stress, where 25 is the green, degrees Celsius is the green, the yellow is 30 degrees Celsius, and the red is 32 degrees Celsius. And on the bottom three are those Aptasia that were experiencing both stressors, nutrient enrichment and thermal stress. And interestingly enough, like I said, we saw that there was a lot more survival of the Aptasia that were experiencing both stressors. But what I found was even more telling and interesting was that the Aptasia that were experiencing 30 degrees Celsius and nutrient enrichment were actually um, significant. So at those first sign of bleachings in 2004, if these aptasia were under those conditions and also experiencing um, bleaching or higher temperatures, there may have been a chance that these may have been able to survive longer than that or those samples that were just experiencing thermal stress alone. And you may ask, how did I know they were dying? Um, the biggest tall cell sign was smell. The smell was terrible. I apologized to my lab because I had the entire lab very smelly for that entire month. Um, these Aptasia are also very, um, they degrade very rapidly, which I had no idea. And so there is a quick change between a healthy Aptasia to a dying Aptasia to me just having nothing. And I found that out very early on, which made me become even more precautious of making sure that I checked my Aptasia just to make sure they weren't, uh, they weren't completely dissolved. And other indications that the Aptasia may have been dying was that they have tentacles that usually are a lot longer and you can see them moving, but as they were dying, they would get shrunken and very rigid. Um, there will also be like this opaque color and it would be very cloudy, the water would be. And um, the Aptasia body became really shriveled. And so there were a lot of indications of Aptasia that were dying. Um, and so I would not wish anybody to have to smell dying Aptasia, it is 
a terrible smell. Um, and so our next question was how did thermal stress and nutrient enrichment affect symbiodynesia abundance? What we have here is a box plot and on the y-axis, we looked at gene copies of the actin gene per nanogram of DNA on the y-axis. And then we had our temperature ranges on the x-axis. And the nutrient enrichment were denoted by the colors where green, there was no nutrient enrichment and the red, there was nutrient enrichment. And what we found was that these stressors combined did not significantly change symbiodynesia abundance, um, which I was not expecting. I was expecting to see a more significant change uh, when both uh, stressors were introduced, more so because of the nutrient enrichment, allowing for more the symbiodynesia to have a lot more nutrients to grow. Um, and our next question was, how did thermal stress and nutrient enrichment affect microbial community structure. And I know this seems like a lot. It's a principal component analysis or a PCA plot. Um, and each dot represents an individual, like one sample and its microbial community. And what we found was that there were no distinctive shifts in this microbial community based on treatments. And I will also like to point out the Y and X axis because this shows that my thermal stress and nutrient enrichment only counted for 35% of the variance in this microbial in the community in the microbial community structure of my individual samples. And so there is another 65% that was not accounted for. And I don't know what other variability uh, could have caused this such broad, this uh, broad assemblage of community structure and randomness. And this also, before I forget, this type of graph is showing you alpha diversity, whereas the next two graphs are showing beta diversity based on the treatments and this is looking at the distance to centroid of the community structure of my microbial samples based on the treatments. And so what we found was that my microbial community structure was stable across treatments, which I did not expect. Of course, I wanted it to have a more broad range where it showed that our samples that were experiencing both stressors were a lot more unstable than those that were that were only expressing the uh, experiencing the thermal stress. And so on the y-axis, the distance to centroid basically gives us the range of how stable or unstable a microbiome is, a microbial community structure is. And so the closer you get to a height, the range shows you um, the stability of it. And but for our sample, for my samples, there was no distinctive shifts between treatments. So if thermal stress and nutrient enrichment did not influence microbial community structure, did any other factors have any effect? And Surprisingly, yes, this is uh, Amplicon data and it's showing bar graphs that give us the abundances which are shown on the all the y axes and then the actual sample names on the x axis and what we're looking at are the abundances of the top uh, 20 microbes in the microbiome. And what I found was that day, the day one microbial community structure was different from days nine, day 11, day 16, and day 18. And then day two was significantly different from day nine, day 11, and day 18. And so now that we know that the community structure varied based on time, our next question 
was what tax abundance was significantly differed. And first, I'm not going to attempt to even say this tax that I've tried multiple times and failed multiple times. So I'm just going to say this one. Uh, this microbe, and if you look at the graph, it is the um, kind of golden brownish uh, bar that represents this taxa. And they decreased on day four, five, and nine, whereas on day 11, 16, and 18, they increased, the abundance increased significantly. And this is important because they are a part of the Flavobacteriae class. And these are key members in the formation of marine biofilms. And biofilms are important because they contribute to the fundamental microbial processes, such as the degradation of organic matter, which means they help with the degradation of dying tissue or they also help with the degradation of environmental pollutants uh, or also help the, the host with photosynthesis and the cycling of nitrogen. And so my takeaways from this part of my research was that nutrient enrichment actually causes a, a um, it basically counter affects the effects of, counters the effects of thermal stress in our uh, sample adaptation for this study. We also found that both stressors did not significantly change the symbio symbiodenisia abundance and it also didn't significantly affect microbial community structure and they were stable across uh, treatments. But we did find, well, I found that the time of exposure to nutrient enrichment did influence the microbial community structure. So as a conclusion, in chapter two, I demonstrated that the absolute quantification and relative abundance of aquaric did not correlate. And instead, the absolute quantification of aquaric, the aquaric TLC1 gene can and could potentially ensure a more standard method for quantification baselines. And if we have more accurate baselines, we can then use, it can be useful in future studies on the white band disease susceptibility of a crop server cornice. In chapter three, uh, my results support some other literature that shows that temperature, stress, and increased nutrient enrichment does not always synergistically promote changes contributing to dysbiosis. And when we look at microbial plasticity that the microbiome exhibits, it can be useful for tracking uh, for tracking the microbial communities within the microbiome for Nigerian's hollow then in the Nigerian hollow biome. And what I mean by that is in my study, I used Aptasia, but this could be also applied to coral as well and be used as a way to infer about environmental factors, host health, and dysbiosis. And so the link between the Nigerian host and its microbiome is becoming uh, increasingly obvious as our understanding of microbial oncology and post-microbial interactions improve. However, as seen in chapter two, where I talk about aquaric, a lot of the times, a lot of these commensal organisms also have traits that overlap with a dysbiotic pathogen. And so with the implementation of next generation omnic technologies, it can offer better improved resolution uh, and scale to look at these 
Nigerian hollow buy-in dynamics and how environmental factors affect these interactions. Um, and with that, we can begin constructing microbial baselines that relate to hollow buy-in changes within ecosystem stress and begin to start selecting indicator uh, taxa and also assessing critical microbial functions. And that concludes my previous PhD work. And now my current work is at Stanford with Dr. Steve Palombi at Hopkins Marine Station. And uh, currently I am working on a project called Super Reefs. And the idea behind Super Reefs is first to predict and we have a, collab a collaborator, Dr. Ann Conan, at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And what they provide us with and they generate are these type of maps that show us the variation, well, predicted models for variations in heat across um, a location. And this location is where I'm at right now, uh, Majuro and the Marshall Islands. And we basically have a gradient of from hot to cold areas. And we then select uh, areas to go to that would um, show the difference in temperature ratios. So we want the very hot to the very, to the cold. So we can be able to compare uh, those coral. And so once we, decide on these locations and where we want to go collect coral, we have to prove that corals that are in these hotter temperatures are can withstand heat better than those in the cooler in the cooler temperatures. And so to prove this, we go to these sites, we go and collect various samples and test their their heat tolerance using these very uh, inexpensive uh, tanks that we build uh, to be very accessible for the local communities. And we use these tanks to essentially build an experiment where we test the corals against different temperature ranges per day. And we um, note the bleaching per day. And once we prove which corals may survive in higher temperatures, we want to use this information with local uh, communities to add to this map, which is marine protected areas. And hopefully with our information, we would be able to add a lot more areas in these dark blue areas to this map. And wh why is it so important to uh, have more marine protected areas? It's because, and I love this graph because it doesn't even talk about coral, which are even more important than the fish because the fish come to the coral. And so if we're able to protect areas where corals, we know corals are able to survive longer in hotter conditions, if those coral are able to survive, we then have more fish, which equals more species, which then adds to bigger fish, with, which overall provides a pro more productive marine life and functional food webs, which then help out the local communities that we work with. So for my acknowledgments, of course, I cannot, can't go without saying thank you to the University of, well, Tuskegee University and the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, where I first began my research as a marine biologist and microbiologist. Um, the School of Natural Resources and Environment and UF, and more specifically, Karen and Dr. Reddy, because they were, some of the first people that I met on campus, even when I wasn't in SNRE and I was in a different department. Of course, I also have to thank the, la the lovely ladies of my lab, and I know some are in the crowd right now and they would kill me if I didn't say it. So this was specifically for you. <laughs>
Um, I would also like to thank the Fish and Wildlife Services because I did a fellowship with them uh, during one of my summers and also Stanford and the Stanford PRISM program, which allowed me to get in contact with uh, Steve. And of course, last of all, I have to thank my family because they have been the ones who have supported me from the very beginning. And that allowed me to pursue my childhood dream of being a marine biologist. And now I'm living that life. And so, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be in this position today. So I would like to say thank you. And with that, I would like to close my presentation and ask if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Devante. That was really, really fascinating. Very um, interesting. And um, I know that we're just like a little over time, actually. So um, what I would encourage everybody to do is if you do have questions for Devante, to reach out to him. Um, I believe, Devante, your contact information is on the flyer that was sent out this week. Um, and so if uh, people do need to go to other classes or you know things like that, they're, they're more than welcome to, to go ahead and do that. Great. Thanks for having us. Congratulations. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for coming. If anyone in the room wants to ask questions, don't forget to hit the button on the speaker. This is so great. Thank you. I'm just happy we got to see what you did in private that made you a doctor. So this is awesome. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> Were there any other questions? Okay. I yeah, I don't think anyone else is left with questions, but um, great job. We always enjoy hearing about your work and yeah, keep us posted on your work out there in Marshall Islands. <laughs> of course, in a remote island in the Pacific that I never thought it would be at. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. If you have any questions for me, obviously feel free to email me anytime. Otherwise, I will see you all next Monday, hopefully in person this time. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Congratulations, Devante. Thanks, Steve. Oh, look at this. I have my new laugh. <laughs>